Psalms 119 verses 41 to 48 under the Hebrew alphabet letter of Vag. And this is a victory in the word. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. Mercy is the treat of offender better than that he deserves. God's salvation according to the Word of God without the Word of God you wouldn't know nothing about God you wouldn't know about the victorious God that we have a lot of things all God has to do is he has to just speak he spoke creation I didn't think when he, when he was dealing with the nation Israel I don't think he had to get little clay and make little you know frogs all he had to do is say, frogs everywhere. And they were. We have a God that is mighty. God's word is so pre, pre is, is so wondrous, so victorious, so great, that the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why they wanted him crucified. Because if Jesus Christ's own mouth, he proclaimed that he was God. And that God is who you plead for mercy that God is you go to salvation and it's all according to the word the word that God has given us as far as salvation is not to build an ark it's not to eat a fruit it's not to obey the law the mercy of salvation for today 2014 until the rapture happens is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That is the mercy God will give you today. And that is the salvation according to the word. And Paul tells us to Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing. So victory in your life, eternal life, comes from the mercy of God, through salvation of God by his word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproaches me. For I trust in thy word. 1 Peter 3.15 says, I am to be ready to give answer to anyone. And even if they reproach you, you are to have an answer. And I'm going to contradict myself, what you think is contradiction, but it's not. There are some times like I had to do Saturday night to tell someone, say, I cannot explain it. You cannot explain the Trinity to anybody. You're not going to give them an answer. When we're talking about free will, cannot give you the answer about free will, even though God knows what you're going to do, but God gives you a free will. I'm not going to get into that round thing again. But if someone comes to you in the way of salvation that needs to know the salvation, you better be able to, with the Bible, show them how to be saved. The right, correct way. No easy believing them. So you need to know the prerequisites on what a sinner needs to know in order to be saved. And then when they come to reproach you, you better be able to give them answer that God has sent that person to you with the answers from the Bible. And you're to use the word, not what you think or not what you've been taught. See, the victory in this word will conquer any religion, any false teachers, anything against God. And again, like I said, sometimes maybe you haven't studied enough. Maybe you come across something new in your life that you need to study when you're dealing with somebody. You never be afraid to say, I don't know. Then you go study. So the next time it comes up, you'll be without excuse. Listen, there was some battle. There's one battle that Joshua lost. But there are little battles in Joshua's life that he, that he lost, that he won. 
when these people come up to him and say, hey, you know, we're from a far country, look at our moldy food, look at our, you know, Joshua learned from that experience, don't take everybody at his word. You learn from your mistakes. But trusting in the word will give you victory and will give you answers. And the answers will come when you read from Genesis to Revelation over and over and daily. The Holy Spirit will use you. And there will be a lot of people. Well, how did, how did all the animals get into Noah's Ark? Easily, when they went through the door. Next stupid question. Where did Cain get his wife from her father? Next stupid question. Then you turn around and say, oh, i got a question for you. What are you going to do with your soul if you were to die right now? Well, I'm a Catholic. You know how to answer a Catholic when he says that? You know how to answer and say, oh, I'm atheist. You have an answer for them? That's reproaching you in the word. And don't get so high and mighty that, oh, I can answer every single question. That's not the thing. you got to do enough Bible reading that the Holy Spirit, that you hide the word in your heart that we already read in Psalm 119, that the Holy Spirit will bring it out of your heart and to the person you're dealing with that you walk away from that conversation. I didn't even know what I was doing. God used me. It's not you using God. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. And I've read some things, you know, being ashamed. What about God makes you unable to talk? Or what if you are ashamed? The words out of the mouth, utterly out of the mouth, means you're speaking. Don't let me have a conversation when somebody is reproaching me and use my words. Lord, let me use your words. Don't let me be dumb when it comes to the word of God. Let me use the Holy Scriptures as you want me to use them, properly, rightly dividing them that I have studied. And not to prove this guy I'm a smart aleck, but to give that guy a way of hope and the truth. For I have hope in thy judgments. That sounds pretty cruel when you read that. For I have hope in thy judgments. And you think of judgments as in, you know, lightning bolts and tornadoes and floods and... Yes, those are judgments. But I've also waited for the judgment when the, when the Lord will put a crown on my head and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That crown is a judgment. A judgment that I have done right. I have pleased my, my Lord and God and Savior. And that my, my, my works, I'm saying nothing that's a, nothing I did for God, but what I did for myself is going to burn up. That's going to be judgment. It's going to be a loss. God said it was going to happen. You know what? I know it's going to be true. I will have loss at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm going to rely on God on those losses that they're not holy. They're not right. And God said they're going to burn. I have hope in that. That God is the holy righteous judge. And that for what I've done wrong is not going is not going to produce anything but ashes. And better yet, it's not going to hang around with me for all eternity. We have a God that not only will put your sins under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but those sins that you do that are not under the blood, that will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, will burn up and will not follow you into eternity. How about that? Even the sins that are not under the blood will be put away. And you'll suffer loss. That's a judgment. I hope in the righteous judge God. 
There are people out there I, I, I dearly love that are lost. And the holy God that I know in the Bible must put them into the lake of fire. It sounds wrong. It sounds, but God is holy and that is his judgment. And I got to say, yay and amen. Because they have not believed on God. They have not trusted. They have not done what God, they have rebelled. They have done evil against God. And that's a righteous judgment. And you got to think about it like that. You can't, you can't blame God. You can't think God's a meaning. Especially when they had ample time, ample opportunities to do what is right. I hope in the judgment of God that God will send people to hell. Now don't, don't make me sound cruel. But there are some people who... If they rebelled against God and did not do what God told them to do, would you really want them in this Catholic universal heaven of universalism that everybody goes to heaven? And, and, and Would you really want them there? Would the Jews really appreciate a heaven with someone like Adolf Hitler? And all the kings that were against him. Would the Jews really be pleasant in heaven when you got the entire United Nations in heaven with them? If that was the case, we would be having World War 14, 15, 16, all the way to 2 million thousand World War. A judgment of God that I hope for is those that rebelled against my God, God will judge. And he will be a righteous judge. And God will judge me also. He will judge me as a sinner as I am, and who I am, and what I have done for him. And the holy righteous judge that no one will go into a courtroom and flash a ring, or a secret handshake, or give some money to go against me. And no matter what like time of Jesus, where they found liars to come in and, and lie against him, that's not going to happen in the courtroom. Either judgment, the great white throne, or the judgment seat of Christ. There will be no briberies. There will be no secret handshake. There will be no, I know him, and there will be no money. I have hope in the holy and righteous God judge that will do right and will not lie. And will have no respecter of persons. And you go from Genesis to, to Revelation to find what kind of judge that is. And that's the judge you're to hope in. Even when you, you, like me, when I am found guilty. And embarrassment and shame to my God, my Savior, to say, Amen, you are right and you are holy. I had that coming. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. Why should I keep the law continually forever and ever? So I will not get the bad judgment, the guilty judgment. If I perform, well, the writer of the he of Psalms 119, a Hebrew, under the law, a Jew that's in the Old Testament, if he kept the law, he will face the God of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if he did what he's supposed to, he would face God as innocent. What did God say about John the Baptist's parents? As concerning the law, perfect. What did he say about Job? He was perfect and upright. Now, their sins were not washed, were not cleansed until Christ came and died and buried and rose again. But if you were to keep the law, if you were to do what God told you to do, the law in the Old Testament, you would stand before the judge. And you have done right. David, 
who had committed adultery and murder, which the law has no sacrifice. But David's heart was pure towards God, and the sure mercies of David covered that sin. Now you go to the other story where you get that rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus and says, what must I do in the eternal life? Oh, amen. Glory to God. Don't you dare tell him to obey the commands because that's not for today. But under the law, Jesus said, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt honor thy parents. And he said, all these I have done from my youth up. And Jesus did not rebuke him. He didn't say, you liar. But Jesus, who's the righteous judge, said, you ain't done yet, son. <laughs> yes, you kept nine of the commandments, or eight of the commandments. But number ten, you, you got a problem with that money you're coveting. So how did that man walk away? He walked away lost. The judge proclaimed him guilty. He did not walk in the law continually. And James says if you offend in one point, you offend in all. The law was to show that you are guilty. I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. Now, liberty is freedom from restraint. Liberty in the Bible is you can walk doing right by the precepts and by the word of God. To be right with God. It's not the liberty to say, oh, I'll go drink, I'll go smoke, I'll go fornicate, I'll go listen to rock music, I, I won't go to the temple like I'm supposed to. That's not the liberty. And too many Americans think the liberty, oh, I can do whatever I want. He says, I will walk at liberty, and everybody wants that, that second period of the comma there, or the colon, I mean, to disappear. But there is a colon there that says, for I seek thy precept. So when I seek God's word, I will walk in his liberty. The liberty to please God and do right. And that liberty is a whole bunch better than liberty to better carry a gun or, or uh, write a newspaper. or It's a liberty. It's the free will to please God by God has given you ability to say yes or no to him. And it's according to the word of God. See, when we went back to, to the beginning, thy mercies and thy salvation according to the word, I have liberty to tell God, I don't want your mercy. I don't need it. I don't want your salvation. I don't need it. I've got my own word, or I don't want your Bible. The Bible's written by man. I have that liberty. I can walk against God. But a man who loves the Lord, I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to study my Bible. I'm going to find out what you are going to allow me to do, God. And I'm going to walk in that, not because you force me to do it, God, but because I want to. That's the difference. God, is not, God does not have a hammer over your head and ready to balk you on the head anytime you you go wrong. You know what the Word says. You know what the Word tells you not to do. And you know what the Word tells you to do. And yeah, I fail. I am a sinner. Even saved under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am still a sinner. I still walk away. But my liberty in my life is to please God and do what He wants. And I don't have to do it. But I want to. I 
I can do like other Christian brethren. I can go out and have a Budweiser if I wanted to. But I don't want to. I have a liberty to say, no, I don't want it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Because God's against it. I have to literally say, if God's against it, so am I. If God is for it, so am I. And my liberty, not that God it, it makes me a robot, but that liberty also, you know what? I sin too. And then I have the liberty to proclaim 1 John 1 9. Or I have the liberty to proclaim, well, I'm just going to forget it. It's not that important. And I had that liberty to have it show up at the judgment or let it be washed in the blood. See, I am freedom from restraint from God forcing me to do anything. But when I put sin in my life, I, I am now under restraint of sin, the world, and Satan. Usually by lust, desire, or guilt or fear then I am no more under liberty these people these gun control nuts they don't have liberty because they fear their guns are going to be taken away they fear somebody's going to come breaking out that's not liberty the definition in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary again is freedom from restraint Freedom is when you don't have anything tied to you. If you got fear and anxiety, you're no more free. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. Paul and Jesus Christ. I, I've told this story before and I know not a king, but somebody of authority. Brother James Knox got to witness to Janet Reno around that time before or after Waco. If you were, if God were to put somebody important in your life, may not be a king, maybe a politician, somebody who people know. Would you be ashamed to share with them the gospel in a couple of minutes that you would have? Let me say something to you people out there who listen to this video. If God were to put President Obama and Michelle Obama in your path for two or three minutes, Christian, and you were given liberty to say anything you wanted to say to the president, what would you tell him? I'm hoping I would say, Sir, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I pray for you and your family. Have a good day. The Secret Service would not need to worry about me and my family if we were to come in front of the President. I hope I would not not be ashamed not to mention Jesus Christ as much as any other Tom Dick and Harry that I deal with on the street now we had a time last year um, Mick Romney we saw his camper the RV whatever you want to call it now, I was told that that was him. I don't know. I, I couldn't tell. I ran up to that bus and I put up my sign about Jesus Christ. I know his driver saw it. I saw someone sitting there where, where the front entrance is. And as it drove by, McMarmy the Mormon, and got, if he was looking out the window, the right window at the right time, got to see the Lord Jesus Christ from me. Paul and Jesus were not ashamed. 
You don't know who God's going to put in your path. You better get rid of your hatred and your false words. You need to realize that God put President Obama in office. And I'm not going to go any further with that study. You read your Bible yourself and know that God puts up and God sets down who he wants. I will delight myself in thy commandments. As a born again Bible believing Christian, can you go to bed with your spouse, hold hands, and say, I have not ever committed adultery? Have you sat in your house? Whatever you're doing, whatever room you see out in the front yard, the police pull up, they get out of the car, and say, I have no fear, I have not stolen anything. How can you say, when you're watching that boob tube and all the commercials, to say, I love that commandment, and you sit there and coveting the commercials? Oh, I think I'll like that hamburger. Next time I'm there, I'll get me one. That's coveting. Wow, look at that car there. That's coveting. I love thy commandments that you're not going to talk falsehood against the brethren. Posters, sports cards, t-shirts of... Sports people and music people. That's idolatry. You know, you can't love the Lord's commandments if you're violating them. Oh, I let my light shine. Do you tell anybody about Jesus? No, I let my light shine. You don't love the commandments because Jesus says, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. That's a commandment. That person that you have talked down at church, on the telephone, or with other people, or in your family, whoever, you have violated the love of God's commandment because Jesus said, love thy neighbor. What could be more of a neighbor than two or the next pew next to you? I will delight myself in thy commandments which I love. Not only do I delight, I love them. What do you love? Do you love what God loves? This is the longest chapter in your Bible, Psalms 119. It's all about the Word. You know what God loves? He loves the Word. You know what it says over there in John that the Word of God that we hold in our lap is more sure of a word of testimony than Jesus' own mouth. God has put himself in a legal predicament here. He put everything down in writing. He had to perform all the 48 prophecies of his first advent. He put it in writing. The rapture has to happen. He put it in writing. There has to be seven years of tribulation. Three and a half of the last year's great tribulation. Because he put it in writing. There must be a person called the Antichrist. Who's going to be killed. Who's going to have his right arm and his right eye pulled out. Because he put it in writing. There has to be a new Jerusalem, new heavens, and new earth. He put it in writing. Do you love that? Or what writings do you? Magazines, newspaper, uh, brochures, travel packets, tickets, sports uh, program, TV programming, anything but the word? Is that what you love? Status. Is that what you love? That's an idol. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments. That's where they get this raising the hands.
Well, what is that lifting the hands up? Hand it to me, Lord. Teach me. Which I have loved. Again. And I will meditate in thy statue. I will think about. I will prayerfully do. I will, I will converse in thought. In the word. <laughs> Alright, I did my reading for today. Okay, what am I going to do now? That's not meditating. Meditate when you read. Wow, I think I got a cross reference over here. Let me get my concordance. Let me, yeah, look at that. Let me study this word. What is? Let me look this word up in the dictionary because I don't know what it means. That's meditating. And too many of you rely on your preacher to do the job for you. Why can't you sit with a dictionary and a notebook? You got the internet. Why can't you search? You can do all kinds of searches through the Bible on the internet. You don't love the word. If you love the word, you'll be in it. You'll be studying it. You'll be marking it. You'll be making reference. You'll want to memorize it. You want to keep it. You want to do. You want to make sure every day. You'll long for it. Victory in the word is when you're in the word. Victory in the word is when you're saved by the word. Victory in the word is to know that God is going to judge you. That you want to be judged innocent. But you're also going to be judged guilty. And that you have the right way of using God's word to witness to anybody, including kings, of God's salvation, which you have. You have the way to give victory to anyone who does not have it. And you're to love it. You're to meditate on it. It is to be your life. There's only two things that go into heaven when you die. Only two. Jesus said the word of God, even though heaven and earth will, will go away, my word shall not go away. I'm misquoting that verse. Forgive me. The word of God is going to be in heaven. Now, what else is going to be in heaven that's yours? It ain't your house. It ain't your car. It ain't your money. It's anybody who was led to the Lord Jesus Christ by something that you've done. Whether you witnessed personally, you gave out a gospel tract, you witnessed to him with an open Bible, you supported a missionary, you supported somebody some way of getting gospel tracts out or going out and telling people about Jesus Christ. You gave money to your local church that goes out and tells people about Jesus Christ. Souls that come to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, that's accounted to you. And the Word of God is the only thing that goes to heaven that follows after you. And for some of you out there, the word of God ain't going to follow you because you ain't in it. And you haven't witnessed to nobody or taken part in any kind of witness or missionary effort. And you ain't going to have no souls. And you'll stand before the judge guilty. Without victory. Imagine one of the things that, uh, this you can take this or leave it. What if on your pile of stuff that before Jesus Christ, before it burns up, wood, hay, stubble, uh, gold, silver, precious stones. What if God had a Bible? What if God brought your Bible and put it on that pile? My Bible's marked. My Bible has soda and coffee stains. My Bible has tears. My Bible has notes of things that happened in my life. My Bible has my fingerprints all over it. Every single page has got my, my fingerprints on it. It's got the, the oil of my fingers on it. It's got my hair on it. It's got stuff I snacked on on it.
What if God took a Bible, this flat, brand new Bible, unwrapped, and that, and that was your life? What if God were to tell a, a story of each page that you read? Let's see, this page right here. You, yep. There's a chapter, Stiley Hayward, that you never read. Numbers chapter 7. Boy, you talked about that chapter. And you never, ever, even with the audio, you never paid attention to it. Well, there's a chapter. Oh, there's a chapter you pay attention to. You like that one. Oh, there's a note from somebody you got saved in prison right there. Let's call that guy up. Let's see how he's doing there. Wow, look at, look at your Bible has prayers for all the people you know. Your Bible's marked on how to read it. Your Bible's got notes. It's got pictures. What would your Bible say? What if God recalled your Bible, your Bibles? Hebrews 4.12. I don't know. You don't have to believe this. Amazing what some of the things the Lord puts in my head. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is quick, alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What if you ever have you ever read your Bible and had your Bible speak to you? You ever have God speak to you in a passage like, Wow, Amen, glory to God. What if God were to bring up your Bible and say, Okay, the Bible is Stiley William Hayward. Tell everybody what Stiley done. Speak to us. What do you say? How many times did he read you? Where's all the places he took you? Oh. Oh, you had brothers and sisters where you had one in the in the, the track bag, you had one in the car. Really? You mean you went to prison with him and and, and t tell me more? Yeah, sometimes he really didn't listen. To, he he read you, but he, he really didn't get into it, did he? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Other times he would listen to you. He'd be a date. Yeah, yeah. Is that funny? It's not, yeah. Remember those times that you read the Bible? You, you know, you were thinking about what you're going to do the rest of the day, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And the time that he went to school, he got really upset because he, he couldn't answer the question. It was, wow, yeah. All the all the reports he did, all the sermons that came out of you. Well, how many sermons came out of you? And then, then a number would come up. How many times did he preach? Wait a minute, what did you say? You mean every night that you weren't in church, he, he taught his family? You opened and taught you his family? Oh, and imagine somebody get up there with their Bible and say, okay, speak to her. What? What? Revelation 4 released the seal. I was never open. It's a clean, crisp Bible. Look at that. Brand new. Never opened. You imagine, if you, listen, we give out free Bibles when we got one. And sometimes the Bible's going to say, I've never been open. I was given free. In America. Don't you say my Bible? Maybe your Bible's going to speak one day. I don't, maybe they just said, maybe it's nothing. I don't know. They get you thinking. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. The 
then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee.